All right. <clears throat> I changed the title just a little bit. I, I did call it Advantages of Virgin Queens. And I field a lot of B phone calls, as many of you do too, I'm sure. And a guy I was talking to recently was asking about me, and I said, uh, well, you know, the main thing that we make money off of that got me out of my day job was Virgin Queens. And he said, why would anyone want a Virgin Queen? <laughs> so I changed the talk to dedicate it to the, that gentleman. <laughs> Here's why. Historical expe expectations of queens, that's kind of what we're up against. Most folks want mated queens, that's a premium product. We all know they're great. So, you know, you're kind of starting to paddle against the stream whenever you do this, but hang with me, there's, there's some cool stuff you may not have thought of yet. Why did I start using virgin queens? Because <clears throat> if I wasn't, I wouldn't expect someone else to. This is the main issue here, introduction issues with virgin queens. And through a lot of pain and suffering, I think I found my way through that, which I hadn't read or heard a lot of people say, so I'll elaborate on that, which if somebody else thought of it sooner, I'll quit calling it this, but I was unaware of it, and so I was like, hey, it's the Stevens Method. Hey, haven't you heard? <laughs> and this was something a lot of us struggle with as queen producers is profitability issues there's a lot of labor intense labor involved in producing open mated queens as a premium product and profitability is was an issue for me i'm sure it is for a lot of others and there's actually a few virgin queen advantages from a logistics perspective and i do logistics well at least until next friday <laughs> and we'll take some questions i'm sure you may have a few so, just looking back, what are we dealing with? Well, cultural. Before Langstroth, everybody kept bee gums. They were just in logs. The queens did their own queen rearing. We weren't really involved in that yet, and they kind of handled it themselves. So queen rearing is kind of a more recent concept, really on a historical perspective. And I, don't, I can't find which book this was. But I remember whenever I was interested in queen rearing, it was a, a popular beekeeping book. And if you flip to the queen rearing section, the first paragraph, part of the first paragraph that you'll read, it says, historically, queen rearing is left up to a select few highly specialized beekeepers. And that just blew me away because you can't have a beehive without a queen. So why don't beekeepers raise their own queens? You know, why is this all outsourced to just a t tiny subset, not even a, you know, half the population, but a tiny subset were raising their own queens. So that kind of struck me. And historically, we bought mated queens. This is ever since they would put bees in the postal service and ship them, they were mated queens. And so I think that's what we expect. And it's a premium product, as I said, so if I have a choice, that's what I would pick too. Mail order packages, it's, it's just kind of what we've done. We've moved towards nukes more, but still package business is big business. So I think Virgin Queens is a relatively new concept. Some of my queen cells here. So this is a question I, got all, I get asked quite frequently. You got any of those mated queens? Anybody see the Dave Chappelle meme where <laughs> you got any? <laughs> okay, sorry, maybe not. Maybe that's a U.S. thing. <clears throat> I used to sell open mated queens. So in the past, I would, I mentioned yesterday, I bought breeding stock first, and then I, gra I figured out how to graft after I paid a lot of money for some nice breeders, which is probably putting the cart before the horse. But as soon as I could raise cells, of course, I'm gonna make nukes and I'm gonna sell open mated queens too, and nucleus colonies. So I sold open mated VSH F1 queens that were laying and had been in a nuke a minimum of three weeks, sometimes four, for $30. Nuke prices at the time were getting up around 175 or 180 US dollars, and a lot of them were brought in. They weren't mated in Missouri, they were coming from Florida, Georgia, where they normally do. And so I would look at 
a nuke box as a unit, like a unit price. We have half of April, May, and half of June for sure. And if I'm leaving these in three, close to four weeks, you know, maybe three rounds if I'm lucky. So out of that nucleus colony, I could work really hard for three months and I could make $90 if everything went perfectly and we all know that doesn't always happen. Or I could sell the whole thing for $180 and make twice as much money. Of course I have frame costs in there, but so I would just sell nukes and not sell open mated queens because I felt like I was picking the heart out of the watermelon and selling it for cheap. Like that, that whole unit is based around her. She's the foundation of everything that's going on there. Without her, they're toast. And she's the source of all the genetics. So especially if you're using specialized queens from a specialized program, it should fetch a higher price. But I just couldn't justify selling open mated queens because of the profit issue. And I was small scale too. I've had a day job up until now. So I understand if you're producing them on a much larger scale and you can hire labor, it's not you doing everything, which it was me doing everything. Um, you know, it might make sense, more sense. As I said, I left them in there quite some time, three or four weeks, but if you've listened to any of Bob Benny's stuff, I know Ian has, he talked about how Chris Werner's queens were so good and they were trying to figure out why they were so good. I'm sure he uses good stock as well. But what they determined was that he was leaving them in the nukes a full three weeks. And they just have that full pheromone profile and they, you can see their brood pattern. So no oopsies or less oopsies get out the door. They're just higher quality. And it always pained me to sell these things because I know I may send some of them to their death. And uh, I know what they look like before they left. Most people had exceptional results with them. And nuke prices did not stay at 175 or 180 dollars. They kept creeping up, and I felt like the nuke prices left open mated queen prices. That, from my perspective, now if you're in South Florida or Georgia and you've got a lot longer growing season, you know you can do more rounds. You could probably justify it a bit more, but still. Like I said, I look at each nuke as a unit. How much can I make off that unit? And how much labor am I putting in it to, for, to make what I ended up with? And I just, I just didn't think they were profitable in my operation. I would rather sell queen cells or nukes. And later I sold some breeding stock, which was pretty much equally unprofitable. <laughs> but virgins, on the other hand, not the case. So some of our Missouri mite hunters here. Why would I start using virgin queens? Well, they all start off as virgin queens, you know, even if they're in a cell, so why not? Procrastination. So if you put them in and you don't mark your calendar like you're supposed to, and you're not paying attention, not that I've ever done that, <laughs> sometimes you end up with virgins. <laughs> Surprise! So procrastination sometimes would give me virgin queens. I've seen a lot of commercial guys throw them out. It pained me to see that, especially if they were good, from good stock. And so started to use them and experiment with them. Culling. Um, these queen cells that you see on the left here that look like, uh, in my eyes, pretty good queen cells. Maybe textbook. Some people may look at them as textbook. If you open up, open up every one of those, like I do, like if you've got a Christmas present and you want to see what it is and you, while your mother's not looking, open it up and see what it is and put it back together, I'll actually grab a hold of the wax, break the cell cup off, and I can see inside there and see if she's viable and see what's going on and then press it back together. And the bees were like, Mom, they never knew any different. But if you open these up and start looking through them, you'll find out that some of these queen cells with tons of royal jelly that look great are dead. Something happened at some point in their development and they terminated. Some of them even made it to the pupil phase and then they die for whatever reason, probably bacterial, viral, potentially. Not black queen cell, something different. But if I open them up, I could see, do they have six legs? Can she fly? Are there wings there? 
because you'll if you open up thousands and thousands and thousands of queen cells, which I've done, you'll see a few weird things once in a while. Sometimes nutritional stress could be mite, viral issues or bacterial issues. Potentially, there's a lot that can go wrong. So whenever you open these things up, I'm if they're undersized, cull. If they're missing a leg, sometimes you'll see their their front legs won't move. They're kind of drawn up. I don't waste a nuke on that. Where if I didn't open them up and I didn't look and cull these, I'm making a nucleus colony. I'm throwing a cell in, so that's labor and time. And I come back and go, well, she didn't mate. <laughs> you know, no, she couldn't fly. Of course she didn't mate. So I get to cull, and I'm only using the largest, best-looking virgin queen. So I feel like it gives you a bit of an advantage. Like I mentioned, too, you're not throwing a dead cell in a nuke, which if you're using cells, you can take advantage of that. I've seen Chris Werner doing that too on one of Cayman's or Bob's videos, I believe. So he was peeking. Holding for instrumental insemination. We, I do instrumental insemination for my breeding program. And if you study under Sue Kobe or some of the people that have influenced her work, ideally you would inseminate the queen on day 10. So, whenever I'm introducing these freshly inseminated queens, it's like trying to get the colony to take a crusty old virgin. So, the most difficult scenario. And whenever I said I learned from pain and suffering how to get these things accepted, it was from getting breeder queens killed. And once I figured this out, so, if you study under Sue, as soon as you inseminate a queen, they love to have her free where she can run around, like under a push-in or whatever, for sperm migration. Well, I would leave them capped in a queen cage in a nucleus colony. I would take them out, inseminate them, put them back in and direct release them so that she could run around. I just assumed they've been feeding her for days now. They're happy with her. Everything's good. Well, you know beekeeping. It's not always good when you think it is. I got in there, and a lot of those queens would be killed. And whenever I would perform my CSI crime scene investigation, every single time that they killed those things, they made queen cells. So with a virgin queen, they don't have that full pheromone profile of those awesome mated queens some people sell. So that pheromone profile suppresses their urge to make queen cells and suppresses the workers' ovaries so that you don't get laying workers. With a virgin queen, she doesn't have that yet, and so they just go in queenless mode and start making queen cells. Well, if they're making queen cells, a lot of times they're rejecting what you're giving them. I mean, I originally thought, well, I'll put the queen in there and she'll kill all the cells. No, the workers killed her before she killed all the competition. So I felt like I got smarter, but I'll touch on that whenever I get to the Stevens method, so hold that thought. Watering virgin queens. Um, I think one thing that throws people off about virgin queens is keeping them alive and in good shape until you can use them in the colony, not just introduction, there's other issues. And watering is one of them. There was one breeder I was talking to and he said, well, are you, you're banking your virgins right until day 10 until you inseminate them? I said, no, I'm just keeping them in an incubator. He's like, what? That didn't work at all for us. So I kind of went through the checklist. Do you have good candy? Yes. Are you adding quality attendance within 24 to 48 hours? Yes. Are you watering them? Phone went quiet. He wasn't watering them. So they can't go get water themselves. If you're keeping them that length of time, they will desiccate and die. So you have to go through and water them. Oh, the sound might be down. Can I turn it up? The video sound? Yeah. Oh, it's pretty quiet. I love that sound. I should say I normally love that sound. Yeah, it's a lot of queens. Yeah. So they were piping, and I really love to hear queens piping. It just brings joy to my heart. And lust, it's 2 a.m. and you have the incubator in your bedroom and they're partying. 
So now my incubator's upstairs in the office so I can actually sleep while they're beep, 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 beep all night long. So number one complaint on virgin queens. They're, they're not mated and laying, of course. Yep. Poor acceptance. I'll get to that. Hard to keep alive if you put them in candy cages right away. I mean, quickly. They've got to either emerge on candy or you've got to put them on candy immediately. And then you add attendance. Um, they're fine. They'll last for a while if you keep them in an incubator. A lot of people think they have a short shelf life. So they'll say, well, after blank days, however many, whatever people say, um, they lose the urge to mate, and so virgins are no good. Well, I've accidentally banked virgins for three and a half weeks, and they still open mated fine. And that was a small batch, and I, that's probably a freak occurrence. Sometimes I don't think they improve with age. At some point they're going to start ovulating and are going to be a drone layer. But the uh, 10 days, 6 days, 7, 2 weeks, whatever, is not set in stone, from what I can tell. So as long as you, your bees aren't wanting to kill them, and we'll cover that in a second, and they have water and food and attendance, they last quite some time. Like I said, with the ones that we inseminate, that's 10 days of age, that's over, well over a week. Poor acceptance, again. Okay, here we go. So, I mentioned I would inseminate these 10-day-old virgins, I would put them in a nuke, I would come back to find them murdered. Every time I went through it, they would have queen cells. So I thought, I can probably outsmart these bees, hopefully. I'll just wait them out. So, three days. A queen lays an egg for three days, it's an egg. Day four, perfect age to raise a queen out of. So I've got to wait longer than that. Day five, if they think they're going to die and they're desperate, day five they will try those 48-hour larvae, even though they're not superior. But it's death or, you know, cut a corner. Day six or so, probably not. Day seven, there's nothing that they'll even attempt to raise a queen out of, from what I can tell, typically. So I would just hold those queens, or I would split seven or eight days in advance, move the bees, feed them to where they're nice, fat, and happy with a nice size nuke. Seven or eight days after that, I would cut all the queen cells. And they'll still, if you have her in a cage like this, now that one's not capped or taped over, but if you confine her and you don't let her out to where the bees can kill her, they'll feed her almost every time, which is odd. So if you wait them out, you can either split early and get rid of those queen cells and then put her in there and let her candy release, or you can just hold her in there that time and then remove those cells. Now you want a candy release. That gives them time to grasp the severity of their situation, that there's no option except that one in a cage. And my tech went up, and I would start to use push-in cages too on my freshly inseminated queens, make sure there were no cells, and I started getting way better acceptance. Well, I thought that I outsmarted the bees, which wasn't the case. Uh, it dawned on me much later, actually. I started thinking, whenever a colony is in an advanced swarming state, what does the queen do or stop doing? She stops laying eggs. And if you watch these colonies, and I love swarmy colonies because those are the ones that want to make me queens, I encourage swarming, which is kind of the opposite of a lot of beekeepers. But I've seen a lot of advanced swarming states and oftentimes, whenever that queen will quit laying so that her ovaries can shrink, you know, she gets smaller and she can fly much easier. She weighs a lot less without full ovaries. So during that time period, oftentimes, uh, queens or bees will confine these queens in a queen cell. You'll see a cut where she tried to get out and they'll feed her through it, but they'll hold her. Has anybody? opened up a colony and they're about to fly the coop and whenever you open them up virgins start going everywhere if you, if you a lot of them they're holding them and whenever you busted in there like a black bear uh, chaos ensued and they started turning them loose so oftentimes 
Whenever a virgin is introduced in nature, there's no eggs, no young larvae, typically open older brood and capped brood uh, in a lot of these colonies. And they're in an advanced swarming state anyway. Um, they've already raised queens, so they're less prone to try to make emergency cells, but nonetheless, um, that's how virgins are typically introduced. So, getting ahead here, I call that hopelessly queenless. And I have to define that specifically because I, I know I'd mentioned this to Sue and some others, and whenever I said seven days queenless, I lost them. But Garrett Dodds was sitting in the last time I ran it by. He uh, does a lot of insemination for the USDA B lab in Baton Rouge. And I mentioned it, and Sue's like, eh, whenever I told him that, and I said, is it anybody? Like right behind me, I goes, you know what I. He's, picking up what I'm putting down, what some people say in the States. And Garrett's like, I know what you're saying. Yes, yep, that makes sense. So I call it hopelessly queenless, but it just means there's no appropriate age larvae to raise a queen out of. So they still have large, fat, white larvae, and they have capped brood, but there's nothing they can raise a queen out of, which is ideal for virgin intro, and it mirrors nature. And honestly, um, open mated queens are typically really easy to get introduced, I say typically. Um, sometimes they'll throw you a curveball, but if you want to pull a bunch of brood over an excluder, shake your queens in the bottom box, you can wait a week and then pull all this stuff out, cut cells. It's an extra step, I understand this, but cut cells and make your splits, and uh, you, your acceptance rate is, is typically really high. And whenever I'm doing releasing open mated queens even, I don't ever candy release them. I know it's usually t historically pretty popular, but I've had them killed before. Um, either they made cells or something was up. Um, one of my friends too, he said he had left some open mated queens that were corked. They were in the three hole cages and he went back to release it and they were biting the screen and they were just ready to tear her up as soon as she got out of there. And they may have had a couple cells, so we took them out. Well, he we went back a few days later, same exact thing. They were biting the screens, wanting to get at her. He's like, man, I don't, I just left her in there. He had to come back a couple days later for something, let her out, and they were just pleased to see her. I have no idea why. It's bees, sometimes they do odd things. But nonetheless, it's an extra step but I feel like I get a higher take on queen cells, definitely virgins. And if you really want to go through the trouble, you can do that with open mated queens too, although it's usually not necessary. But freshly inseminated queens, it works great for them too. Some of our queen cells. Ian probably knows Natalie, she came down and helped me graph. She's a complete rock star. She's got a little YouTube channel too. I say little, it's probably better than mine. But she's got a YouTube channel, graphs, and is doing a lot of cool stuff. And uh, <laughs> she's, she's a beast. So we were catching attendance for these virgin queens too afterwards. Not everybody loves to do that. Uh, she sat down and I, she goes, what do you do? I said, well, most people say to get nurse bees to put in with your virgins or open mated queens. I don't like to do that necessarily. And if you think, think about it this way, so if a nurse bee, the little fuzzy ones you see, emerges from their cell, when's the last time they ate? Before they pupated. So those nurse bees are nutritionally deficit. If you look around on your open brood frames and you see the girls with the giant booties. That's the ones you want. Don't smirk again, your wife's sitting right beside you. <laughs> the reason why is those worker bees are gorging themselves, which fires up their hypopharyngeal glands, and then they're feeding that open brood. And they're too fat to sting you. <laughs> so that works too. So I just grab both wings, press them against the comb, grab both wings and stick them in there. So I showed Natalie like 30 seconds. I'm like, here's the ones you want, do this. She just sat down barehanded and starts adding six to every cage. I'm like, gosh, it's a shame she doesn't work clo live closer. I'd put her to work. Then her dad, 
He's not here to witness this. He's like, oh, I'd like to try it. I was like, okay, Chris, here you go. This is what you do. He's like, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, ooh. okay, I'm done. Here you go. <laughs> so if you need attendance caught, she's probably too far from you, but this is a young lady you want to hit up. She's great. So whenever these cells emerge, immediately I put them into candy cages. So these are some new queens that are crawling around in there before I take them out to the apiary and add attendants. Okay, here we go. This is the advantages I feel of virgin queens. From a logistics perspective, I guarantee live delivery in the States. I ship next day air only. So if something shows up dead or doesn't show up, I just replace it. I eat it. I just send you a new one because I feel like that's what I should do as a producer. It keeps people happy. Queen cells. David Mixa and some of those people are absolute masters at shipping queen cells, and I know it can be done, but I also know what margin of error UPS Next Day Air has. Every single one of those that do not deliver next day, if it delivers the following day, they're dead because they're coming out later that day whenever they're supposed to arrive. So every one that they miss, I would have to eat. I don't like that. With virgins, that's not the case. So with virgin queens, you miss a day, no big deal. They've got attendance, they've got candy, they've been well watered. And I actually think virgins are the hardiest type or phase of queen, if you will, to ship. So queen cells, if they miss delivery, they're dead. Virgin queens, I think, are superior. Have you read uh, Ali McAfee's work, I think Project Apis M helped fund it, of temperature extremes during shipping, and it affects sperm viability in the spermatheca. So if, you, if it gets a little hot, or I don't know about low temps, I need to go back and look at it, but it's in uh, American Bee Journal if you want to reference it. If you start hitting temperature extremes, which happens all the time in shipping, your queens could be great whenever they hit the post, and they could be damaged whenever they show up, even though they look alive and everything's okay. Virgin queens have not yet mated. There's no sperm to damage in their spermatheca. They mate at your place. Never been picked, never had to stop egg laying and then start egg laying again from being caged. I just feel like as far as from a logistics perspective, virgin queens are the best. They're a good way to introduce certain genetics, just like queen cells are. If you can pick up or ship queen cells, um, that's a good way to inject that into your population, especially if they were grafted out of instrumentally inseminated breeders, assuming they did the testing to where uh, the paternal line and maternal line both carry that trait set. So think about it this way. In theory, if I grafted out of a VSH breeder and all the drones that I inseminated her with were VSH, Whenever she gets to your place, you don't have VSH. That's okay. They mate with your drones that do well in your area. 100% of the drones from 100% of those queens, assuming this was all tight, will be VSH or any other tra specific trait you're after because they're, they're, they don't have a father, only a grandfather. So technically it doesn't matter what they mated with as far as drone production, but that will make up 50% of your brood nest. But according to Harbo's work with VSH, even if they're open mated, if they came out of a breeder, that F1 colony should have a fair amount of measurable resistance and all the drones they're gonna produce for her entire life uh, should be resistant. But that applies to whatever you're looking for, a certain color, um, certain traits, same thing. If you use insemination, those drones are gonna just flood your area. So if you queen whole yards with this stuff or a certain trait you're after, it's a really good way to stick it into your population to where you can start selecting out of it. And then you've got a, a nice little hybrid too. Heterosis. Um, like Ian's a cattle farmer. If you take a Charlet bull and you stick it in with a bunch of Angus cows, you get a, a hybrid. And with a hybrid, you get heterosis. Heterosis is, they call it hybrid vigor. It's basically because 
Uh, you have so much genetic diversity. I don't know what it is about cattle, too. Uh, they're just more vigorous and robust. They seem to grow quicker. They have less issues. And that's because you're crossing two unrelated lines. So if you buy F1 VSH or whatever, daughter queens from whoever you're wanting to get them from, you bring them to your operation. They mate with your bees that are not, in, not related to them. Um, you get some solid colonies from heterosis. Get a localized blend. Some people argue over whether local has any merit, but most everybody I've talked to here said they love a good black bee that can handle a winter and can be conservative of stores. So I feel like we know 50% of that brood nest, the workers are from whatever your drones you had in your area. So I still feel like they have an advantage. You get heterosis and you kind of you're mating with drones that work well in your area, you know, that you manage not to kill, potentially. But I feel like it's a, a really good blend. I said this already, the daughters, you know, if you're using instrumental insemination and your testing is extremely tight, those drones are very predictable. This is the main reason. Like these other ones are great and cool, but it comes down to the bottom line. Uh, I'm quitting my day job Friday to do bees full time. I would not do that if I didn't know what I could make on a bad year. Uh, Missouri, I don't know if you've heard this or not, they, they say, uh, if you're from Missouri, they call it the show me state. So somebody makes a claim and they go, show me. <laughs> I need to see this. I've seen the profit that I can make on a, on a rough year. I know what I can produce. With my day job, we shipped a little over 2,000 virgin queens last year, and it was the worst spring nectar flow I've had. So I know that I'll survive, even if I got a bad year or two. It'll be okay. So the bottom line is you have all the, you're saving labor on making these nukes up. You're saving the time of waiting on them to lay and you can sprint capacity. So if you've got something specific and you're doing cool things with a breeding program, I think you should look at selling virgin queens. And if you have an extremely short season, which mine is short, yours is probably worse, um, you don't have time to wait three weeks to turn these queens and turn these nukes. If you've got a special breeding program and you're producing quality queens, I think uh, people here should look at being open-minded about this and, and you could use the virgin intro protocol and try it. I get a lot of repeat business so I think you'll be surprised if you've got a local producer that can make a ton of cells or virgins but nukes and time are a problem, you should really look at this. It, it could make you some money. All right. What questions have you got? I think she's going to run a mic back to you. Thanks for hanging with me. That was right after lunch. And I don't think I lost anybody that I, that I saw. Yes. So I was curious, uh, and this is his first part of my question. Huh? Mm -hmm. At what uh, date do you put yourself in your incubator? And then why I ask that is because what I found in, uh, in my cell builders, and if you have hygienic bees, which your bees are quite hygienic, mm -hmm. um, I found that if I kept my, my, my cells in my builder almost right until you know, the end, then the hive itself tear uh, would tear down all yeah. the bad cells for me, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have to, you know, go and take all that time and try and look at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you, have you ever found that? I have, and and sometimes they tore them down because a virgin drifted in there, or something happened to massacre my profit for the week. So I usually pull them out at seven days after grafting. Now this is my with a day job schedule. So I would take off every Monday through April, May, and June, and I graft every Monday. So then the following weekend, I've got virgins emerging, and it would give me the weekend to catch attendance and get them prepped, and then Monday, next day air, they would get shipped out. So it just kept me on a tight schedule. So I pulled them out at seven days, 
and put them in an incubator. You don't have to do that, but at the same time, occasionally people would pick some up or they would start emerging and there's thunderstorms and the weather is really terrible and I didn't care. I just opened the door with my cup of coffee, pull my cells out, start emerging virgins. And then when the weather clears up, I can go out attendance. So that, that worked for me, but you know, you could, whatever works for you and your schedule, you could alter that. Cool. I graphed on Mondays too. It's a good day to graph. <laughs> the Monday club. <laughs> thank you, Corey, for an interesting sure. presentation. Sure, thank you, Art. Question I have for you is um, when you introduce these queens to a queenless hive, mm -hmm. you indicate that you go into there later on to pull out uh, to pull out cells that the uh, that they've drawn. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, any experience working with pheromone strips? I have. I do not. No, that's a good question. I had a conversation with somebody else earlier about that, um, and he pitched the idea out because I think he even would clip them in half and throw half of one in there if it was a nuke. So no, I haven't thought about that, and it would suppress cell. I just, I just, this is me just thinking out loud. I know it would suppress the cells. Um, I still feel like you would have to wait or leave that in there long enough until that larvae ages out. I feel like if you removed it prematurely, they may start. I don't know. Well, having used uh, pheromone strips, we've got pheromone strips that are probably eight years old. They go into the freezer for winter time and, and when we're not using them. But when we're making nukes, we'll put a, a queen, uh, we'll put a pheromone strip into the nuke, and they are just uh, you know happy like like pet pet puppies, and you can you can wait to put a queen cell into there mm. for uh, you know at least 24 hours and probably more, and I'm thinking that that's something that in, in the in the example that you used would save you quite a bit of work. Sure. I want, to, I want to ask you a question too, Art. Do you think that, and this is just theory, but do you think I could throw half of one in there potentially and go ahead and add the queen? Would that cause them to attack her because they think they have one? Or do you think that she would go ahead as normal? I, I didn't get the question completely, okay. but I think what you asked is can you leave that, that pheromone strip in there? While you add the... Oh, you can you can leave it there until you add the queen cell or the queen. Then you want to take it out. It, don't leave it there indefinitely. Okay, okay. I'll have to experiment with that. That's an interesting concept. And, and this is, sorry, my, my English is not so good as yours because I'm you come from Ukraine. And the question is, we use that pheromone strip. Okay. Uh, and uh, that pheromone strip we put uh, just only in, in case to keep bees calm and uh, to keep them uh, like tight. Then mm -hmm. they don't feel they are uh, they they are uh, queenless. That's, that's Interesting. Right. Instead of that. Well, that that's why I was curious, and I'll probably just have to experiment. And one question, and sure. One question to you: Which type of uh, nuke boxes do you use? I typically just use a five-frame nuke box. Um, I don't know if Man Lake ships up here, but the the ones I use are like three eighths of an inch narrower than a Man Lake box. Is it smaller uh, frames that? Uh, Frame? Yes, Langstroth frames. Yeah, it's just a five frame. But as far as the width of the box, I feel like Man Lake's boxes were okay for a honey super, but the frames get too fat. So the ones I use are Cypress that I buy locally, and they're about three eighths of an inch narrower on the inside than a five, than a Man Lake box. And I wish I knew exactly what that measurement was, but it's a five frame deep Langstroth box. Okay. And also for uh, like, like that type of uh, queen produ produ production, you have to have a, a lot of bees. True. You, and if I, do, if I did minis or something, there's some people that'll do minis around me with open mated queens. I think that's more efficient. Um, if I hadn't got away from open mated queen production, I think that's what I would use. But these, whenever I make them, um, my intention is to keep them, and a lot of times I'll winter them in a five over five frame, or if they just get too out of hand, I'll put them in 10 frame equipment. Okay. 
And uh, in fact, one person more sorry. <laughs> Which kind of builder do you use? Do you use Quinlas builder or like you use starter and uh, finisher label after that? Um, I've used all different kinds, but right now I use a Quinlas starter finisher. Um, I think what's different about my cell builders compared to a lot of people is you'll, um, if you read a lot of literature, they'll say they make a cell builder. Like I find a cell builder. And the difference between the way I look at it and some other people look at it is I wait until, I mentioned earlier, I, like, I encourage my bees to swarm because after they're already triggered and they're already making queen cells, they've got everything they need and they're in queen production mode. I go through there and take the old queen out with a frame or two because you're going to have to make a slot for your grafts and I remove the other cells. I, I graft. I'll use that for three weeks and then I'll requeen them. So usually those big double deep colonies that are completely packed with bees, if they're already wanting to swarm without boosting them, I can do three rounds of 40 grafts and so I can expect to get about 100 cells or virgins out of those big double deeps. So whenever I see swarms leave, it makes me want to cry because uh, you know it's about 2,500 bucks flying off into the trees for me. Um, yes. Do you ever patch the virgins in the cages that have been preloaded with the attendants? No. Um, I've done it before whenever I wasn't going to be around, so that's a definite thing that you could do. Usually, we'll start opening up queen cells whenever we know they're about to emerge, and if their wings are already fully formed and they're moving, I just put them in there. Because if they hatch during the evening or at night while I'm actually trying to get some sleep, they die really quickly. So I think that's a good idea. And if you don't have attendants in there already, at least have some candy. Yeah, you could preload with candy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Maybe a little on the softer side and some attendants. Absolutely. Yep, that's a great idea. And there's a new product out. I think it's 3D printed, easy peasy. Yep. Um, they snap on your cells and everything. Those are precisely made for that. And Dan had sent me some to experiment with. I used them a little bit, but I'm so stuck in my ways about me or the kids or Jamie going through, you know, whenever they're about to emerge and just shaking out the ones that are ready, that, uh, you know, I, I don't have them in that. And then those easy peasies aren't ready to throw in a Jay Z Beezy box and ship next day air. So I just put them in there. As soon as they're wiggling, I add attendance pretty quick and then they ship next day air. Great question. Okay, so you're at 79 days, mm -hmm. then you insert your virgin. Um, is three-day release your handy, or do you do two-day release? Um, it's typically 24 to 36 hours. Now, I make my own candy, so sometimes there's a little bit of inconsistency. You know, I make candy like Grandma cooks sometimes. Like, <laughs> it's a little wet. It needs a little more powdered sugar or whatever. But, and yeah. Then, um, have you noticed there's a difference um, three days, four days, walking around the hive before a virgin is mating, or is she on your mating plates uh, sooner? That's a good question. If they're confined that long, I mean, it happens pretty quick, but just, uh, and I'm not speaking from experience, but just literature here, I think it's, is it estimated five or six days post-emergent? That's typically when they start flying. I know there's a window. They're always breaking the rules. But, you know, I figure if you hold them an extra couple days uh, to make sure the cells are out so they don't get murdered, you know, a couple extra days doesn't seem to hurt them at all. The, the biggest risk is getting killed by workers in the colony if they have cells, from what I found. I think that's why people have bad luck with virgins, because they just start making cells and reject her. Uh, I was going to ask for your queen, queen candy recipe, but yeah, it's, it's, like it's not perfect. <laughs> no, I will say, though, I th you. You could probably use regular powdered sugar, but I know it has cornstarch in it, and so I usually make my own powdered sugar, and then I'll have a little bit of, uh, there's still a little bit of granular sugar in there too, so I almost think of it like if you're making concrete, you know how you add cement and a little bit of aggregate? <laughs> it's got that in there. And then you should probably use uh, an invert sugar syrup as a bonding agent for it. They like honey better, but 
if you cannot prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you don't have American fowl brood, even if you're using antibiotics, I know Dr. Wood was talking about there's still spores in there and whatnot, so you probably shouldn't use honey unless you're using it for yourself. So invert sugar syrup, homemade powdered sugar, and mix it up until it's firm. Now you have to think about this too. Um, it'll pull moisture a lot of times. I was talking about watering your virgin queens. Well, that can be a real problem. Some people want to just spray them or do it a quick way. I have to go through and water each one under a faucet because that water gets into your candy and it's a sticky disaster. So the consistency is very important. You almost want it a little bit dry if you've got humidity in your incubator because it'll pull some moisture. So I really do need to nail down exactly what parts of what I'm using. That way other people could use it too. Um, and it would probably be quicker for me because sometimes I keep having to add in the other ingredients because the consistency is not how I want it. So that's something you want to think about. You don't want it too firm, but you definitely do not want it too wet either. A follow-up question or comment. First, I, uh, when I've had virgin queens emerge from the incubator, I put a dab of cream, soft cream honey mm. into the kid beforehand so they had something to eat to right away. And also sometimes I've mixed pollen in as well so oh. you get the, the, that. This, uh, That's a good idea. One as well. My other question is temperature. Um, when you're uh, allowing virgin queens to emerge, do you keep them at the same temperature as the mm -hmm. cells? I do. Not any experimenting with a few degrees cooler after immersions. No, I haven't. I usually just leave it the same because sometimes I've got another batch of cells in occasionally or cells that haven't emerged yet. And so I just leave it. It's my, I think my incubator runs about 92.7, 92.8 Fahrenheit, what that is in Celsius, I'm not sure. I have to use my smartphone. But that's about where I keep it. And I think you can get a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler, a degree or so, when it's probably not going to make much difference. But if you get too far outside of that range, of course, it'll speed up or delay development. Because I'm a teacher, can you please describe how you water your queens? Yes. In every detail. And my second question is, you told us how much you sell mini queens for, but what do you sell versions for? About the same price. So, to touch on the pricing, typically I've sold them for $25 each. I know Adam at VP Queen sold virgins years ago for $25 each, so I just kind of stuck with that number. As you know, in recent years, everything under the sun has gone up. So on orders of 20 or less, I bumped it up to 30 each in US dollars. And anything 21 over is 25. No minimum, no maximum. Next day air only. So to water the girls, I get in my bathroom, line everybody up. I turn the faucet on where it's just oh, it's running lightly and I just get water on my, I would stick my finger under it. You know, when you flip your finger over, there's a little droplet on it. I just start wiping. I'm using JZBZ cages. So if you're, if you have them in a shipping bar, once they emerge, I stick them in the shipping bar. Well, you saw a video of that. And those two slots in the top, I just wipe water on it and it adheres and they'll immediately go up there and start drinking. And I just go through all of them one at a time quickly. And once they stop drinking, if there's still water in there, I mentioned about your candy getting gross and sticky, I take a towel and dry the excess water off of it and then I put them back in the incubator. How often are you watering them? Once a day, if not twice a day. And whenever you catch attendance right out of the colony, if you did that midday and you tried to water them that evening, most of the time they're not thirsty. Now I'm in a high humidity area, so they could be. You might check it, but most of the time it's the following morning or so before they'll want to drink, at least in my case. Good questions. Hello, just curious if have you ever encountered uh, queen cell that didn't hatch in your incubator? A queen cell that didn't hatch? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's commonplace. Okay, if you look at the jelly inside, it's still white, not like normal left over that is brown, is dry. Yes. Do you encounter that? Yes, that it's, uh, you know, a lot of people 
want to just look in the top of the Jay-Z BZ and like see a lot of jelly, which is good most of the time. But it can be bad because some of the ones that are duds are completely full of jelly because no one ate it. You know, they had something wrong with them and they perished. So there's a ton of jelly in there. And I know some people, if they eat all the jelly, they think they didn't get enough to eat and want to throw them away. But most of mine have a jelly in the top whenever they're done. But I've had batches that ate all of it. And maybe they could have been fed slightly better, but the quality of the queens looked like it was really good. Now this is generally speaking. If the quality of the queens don't look good, if they're undersized, if something's wrong with their wings, and this stuff happens, like I said, if you open thousands and thousands of them, <clears throat> occasionally you'll see some weird stuff. So it's, it's nice too to track which cell builder you come out of. I don't just use one cell builder. And if one of them, I just call it, this is super scientific, if it's got funk, if it's throwing some cells, you know, 50% of them are good and you're getting a lot of culls, I scrap that cell builder and requeen it. And then I've got other cell builders going so I'm not completely starting over again. But yeah, it, it happens. Do you think it's uh, uh, sometimes the transfer from the cell builder to the incubator, like uh, the shape a little bit? And I, don't, I don't think it is. Oh. Occasionally, if you see a cell that's abnormally long, you know, some new beekeepers are like, whoa, that one's huge. I mean, they're always dead. I don't know why, but sometimes the larvae slips like you're talking about, and they just keep building the cell longer. So if, they're, if, in, if there's any extremes, way too small or way too long, I'm really suspicious of them. But uh, yeah, sometimes if there's way too much jelly in there, I'm a little suspicious, but sometimes it's just because they're so well fed. So it kind of depends. I, I base my judgment on what comes out the other side and how it looks. But yeah, I definitely see cells that are not good, but from an exterior appearance, they look good. So that's why I open them up. At what stage are you peeking into them? Is that like day 16 or yeah. when are you checking them? Right whenever they're starting to emerge. So this would be like 10 days post grafting. So like day 15. Now here's another thing too. Um, some of, for some reason, especially like the old VSH lines that I was using that Tom Glenn was producing with partnering with the USDA B lab. Some of those queens would emerge a bit early. I say it seemed like day 15 approximately or later on day 15, oftentimes they would start emerging. And I feel like it was breed specific. Maybe I was incorrect or maybe at the time my incubator was a little bit warm, but it sure didn't say it on the thermostat. So I think you want to check in before you think you need to look. And if you look in them and they haven't turned color yet or anything, you've still got some time, but it's kind of surprising how quick they'll actually develop and get pigment and start wiggling too. So about 10 days after grafting, which a lot of people where I'm at call a 10 day cell. So 10 days after you graft a ripe cell. So about 10 days after grafting is when we'll start looking in there. And they're pretty consistent, but you know, it seems like out of every batch, there's a range of when they'll emerge, you know, sometimes up, upwards of 24 hours. Great question. One more? Yeah. If there's a problem, sorry. Sorry, my question. No, it's okay. Just, what's your call rate? What's your call rate on your virgins compared to your cells? Oh. Um, we, we normally call 40% of our cells to get like over 80% acceptance, 90% acceptance. Sure. Are your virgins, are you calling? Because you it's, can do a better. Oh yeah, you can see everything. There's nowhere to hide. I mean, I would guesstimate it at less than 10%, honestly. But there's times where certain cell builders will be 40 or 50%, but that's where I was talking about. I scrap those builders and requeen them. It's not black queen cell virus, but there's something up. Is it bacterial? Is it viral? I don't know. The colony looks okay. You know, no sign of disease or poor brood pattern, but there's something up with it. And of course, nutritional stress will affect this. So if your nectar flow shuts off or your pollen shuts off, your take will start going down and your cull rate will go up. So it seems like, you know, we have a bell curve for a spring nectar flow, except last year it was like this, like hitting a bunch of speed bumps at 55. Usually my queen production will follow that 
And if you're on your low end of your nectar flow or pollen flow, the call rate's higher. And so you do one call or two calls? Would you do one call with cells and one call with virgins? I'll just call the virgins now. Now, if I'm selling queen cells, I look into every single one of those before I sell them, but I'm selling those for 15 each, you know, which is a little bit higher than what a lot of commercial guys are selling them for where I'm at. But yeah, those are all pre-inspected. Yep. I was going to ask why you do the peeking if you're inspecting the virgins, but you just answered it. <laughs> <laughs> I read your mind. Anybody else? One more. Okay. Is uh, with the SMR. Mm -hmm. Is the with the SMR is is the main behavior of the bees that suppresses the mite, is that the capping, and, uh, or uncapping and capping that the bees do, that is suppressing the, the mite reproduction in with the SMR trait? That's a good question. I mean, I think that a lot of the literature points to that or shows that as evidence, but if you look at the old USDA, uh, I think there's still a document on the internet you can find from Harbo, Jose Villa, I think Harris was maybe there at the time. Um, they'll say, if you start to see bald brood or uncapping, that's your first visual cue that you have. Could have VSH, but they always uh, conclude with, but you actually have to test to know if that's what it is. But that was the first visual indicator. So I think there's multiple things going on here. I mentioned yesterday, and I need to read it more in depth, but I've got the Cliff Notes version from a couple friends, which could be dangerous. But Fanny Mondet Mondé has, if I understood correctly, uh, evidence to show that they don't allow the hygienic component of, of cap alteration or removal, because I think a lot of mine, they just throw it out. Um, it could be a brood effect. What, what is the brood effect? I don't know if the paper made a statement or a, a thought of what it could be. Uh, my thought was it had to be some kind of mechanical, um, whether they're not getting the right protein to ovulate. Um, you know, like a mosquito has to have a blood meal before they can lay eggs. The varroa female feed on that pupa. I don't know if it's a type of protein they're withholding um, to delay ovulation. Uh, I don't know exactly, but it seems like there's a, a kind of a brood effect documented, and then there's a hygiene effect documented. And so it's really made me question the definition that I had historically of suppressed mite reproduction, which was changed to varroa sensitive hygiene. I'm starting to use them as separate measurable phenomena now, and maybe I'm off base. I'll have to test more and learn more, but it seems to me like uh, there's multiple things going on there. So it could be brood effect devoid of hygiene, or it could be capping alteration, disturbing them, or just throwing them out. Um, like it, whenever I catch drones, I'll put a piece of queen excluder on the entrance, and then whenever they're all coming home from the singles bar, the door is locked, and then I come along and catch all of them. They're not on there very long, because I know I almost have it pinpointed at each time of the year, according to the daylight hours, when they're flying, and they're not on there but maybe 30 minutes. If they're on there 15 or 20 minutes, a lot of them I'll go through there and there's drone pupa stuck, like purple-eyed drone pupa stuck in that excluder because they're trying to throw it outside and the door is obstructed. But, but that opens another can of worms because if you talk to Harbo and some of them, they'll use a worker brood exclusively for an SMR BSH assay. And I, I think they have said that they don't work br drone brood as much, but a lot of the stock that I've got works drone brood as aggressively, if not more, than worker brood. You know, I've got more pictures of it than my kids probably on my phone. Don't tell my wife I said that. <laughs> but it's something that I see repeatedly. So I don't know, and I don't know that all colonies are that aggressive either, so I, I've got to get a lot more documentation to back up my theories. But that's kind of where I'm at. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you all very much. I've... <clears throat>
I was excited that Ian asked me to come up and that you invited me, so I'm honored that you did and very glad to be here. So thank you again.